Cool, we've done the first law for closed systems. Now we're talking about the first law for open steady state systems. So we should talk about what, what's the steady state assumption, what does steady state mean? Uh, we should relook at our conservation laws in light of the steady state assumption and then define a mathematical, this is the first law for steady state, um, steady flow systems. So generally when we're designing the operating condition of a plant or a process, power plant, whatever, um, generally we design for steady state, steady flow. Um, uh, just out of interest, when you're designing a footbridge, generally you design for the fully constructed condition, how bad was that collapse during construction? So you need to design for every point along the way it's not just good enough that when the whole thing's assembled, it'll work. It needs to work along the way as well. Um, that also works with our systems in a thermodynamic sense. Right? That's fine. Um, you want to design something that runs efficiently and well in a steady state operating condition, but also runs at least reliably on the way towards steady state. So it's not just good enough if it works when it's hot. Um, it also has to work on the way to heating up. But once it's there and it's what we'll consider, we say things are steady state and steady flow. So this means that over the period of our observation, so after run up and before cool down, the properties don't change with time. So properties, so this is the temperature at a location, the specific enthalpy at a location, those sorts of things. Um, and if there's mass flow, that also doesn't fluctuate. So the mass flow doesn't change with time. Uh, using an early analogy, the bathtub isn't filling up or emptying, it's maintaining its level. Um, yeah, how long does it take, or which is faster? Okay, this is, so this is something that's coming out of um, South Australia into the public conscience, so I feel like you should know. Um, which is faster to start up, a steam power plant or a um, gas turbine power plant? By what kind of factor? Ten times. Ten times is longer, I think. Don't know. No, nah, it's less than 100. Somewhere in there. But I think, I think gas turbine, I think they were saying in, in South Australia that they can respond in about six minutes with a gas turbine system. Um, I think to achieve steady state for steam, you can take like half a day. Um, Achieving steady state with a calcine used to take like a day and a half, like two days. So you'd turn it on, it would warm up and it would hiccup and muck around. So um, during that time, you're not having good, and of course the attraction, sorry, the South Australian tie-in, was the attraction of a battery is it can respond in functionally real time with, um, with network demands. Uh, we'll see what the new government has to say about that. So during your startup period, you're still putting energy in, you're paying the capital cost on the equipment, um, but you're not getting good product, um, good production out of it, that represents a cost. And so for a lot of these sort of machines, we like to keep them running all the time. Um, yes, let's leave that. Good. Conservation. So what does conservation of mass and conservation of energy look like in an environment where we're at steady state and steady flow? Conservation of mass, we said that mass into the system minus mass out of the system must equal the change of mass in the system over time, okay? And so if there's no change in mass in the system over time, the mass into the system must equal the mass out of the system. All right, and there's, there's a summation here because you have lots of inlets and or lots of outlets. Um, you can't have only inlets or outlets and achieve steady state. And I just want to put some things down here around how mass flow rate can be represented. So mass flow rate can be density times volumetric flow rate. Uh, it can be volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. That's just using density as a reciprocal of specific volume. Um, volumetric flow rate can also be the area times by the velocity. Okay, and so I've, I've pulled that over to the right. We're going to use that relationship later. But if you, anyone done 2600 or a fluids course? Good, you've already done 2600, cool. Then you shouldn't be happy with me saying this. So this V here is velocity, okay? No strike through, 
that v there is velocity. You shouldn't be happy with that equation because you should know that towards the walls, a fluid will flow slower and towards the center of the pipe, the fluid will flow faster. So actually what we're interested in is integrating across the area, okay, the normal component of velocity times by the density at that point. So the density is inside the integral here, so I've got a compressible fluid. Units of mass flow rate, mass flow rate, kilograms per second. Kilograms per second, okay, excellent, good. So what about conservation of energy? So that's conservation of mass, mass in, mass out. Cool, we'll see that. Conservation of energy. For our closed system, we kept the terms on the right of this equal sign and we got rid of the mass flow rate term on the left hand side because there's no mass flow, but the energy in the system can change. Now we're talking about something different. Now we're saying, okay, there is mass flow in and out of the system, but the internal energy, the velocity and the potential en the kinetic energy and the uh, potential energy aren't changing with respect to time. Whatever they are, they're staying where they are. And I've also changed work here. I've put a little S under here to note shaft work. Shaft work is generally what we care about in this subject. In a steady state, steady flow system, you can't have moving boundary work. Right? Moving boundary work is like a cylinder. You're compressing it and you're releasing it. Okay? That's something's changing with time. We're talking about something like a turbine where the casing is fixed and the shaft is turning. That's how you're getting work out of the system. Right? So typically you won't have moving boundary work to worry about. It'll be a, um, it'll be a shaft work term. So now we need to deal with the energy associated with mass flow. So before we just did internal energy, we'll talk about mass flow work. The energy associated with mass flow has two components. Okay, so when you've got uh, steam entering, hot air entering, liquid water entering your boundary, okay, you've got the mass flow times by the specific energy that that fluid brings with it. And the specific energy that fluid brings with it is the same construction as what was on the right-hand side of our equation last, when we did closed systems, right? So the specific, uh, the energy within that system will involve thermal energy, internal energy U, and it'll involve <laughs> kinetic energy, V squared on two, and it'll involve potential energy, okay? But your flow that's coming in is also bringing with it work associated with that flow. And the way you can think of this is, that you've got pressure and velocity impacting over an area, okay? And so that's working on the fluid inside the boundary. Now, what's the flow work? So just coming off to the side, it's the force associated with the fluid times by the velocity, okay? We would say work equals Fs, meaning displacement. But if we differentiate with respect to time on the left-hand side, we can differentiate with respect to time on the right-hand side. So we can say force times velocity. But the force of the fluid, the force the fluid can bear is the pressure of the fluid times the area is the total force. Okay? And now we can use this relationship from a previous page that said m dot v equals av, and we pull that in and we say, well, our av term is m dot specific volume. Bring mass out the front, and you've got mass flow rate times by the pressure of the fluid times by the specific volume of the fluid. So that's the work associated with the flow coming into or out of the system. Everyone happy with the, <laughs> that little manipulation? Good, stretching, excellent. All right, now, because we've got a mass term here, mass flow rate term here and a mass flow rate term here, we can pull those out. Um, out of the bracket, we collect our internal energy and our pressure term, okay? And we see that this is our definition for enthalpy, that internal energy, plus pressure times specific volume is our definition for enthalpy. And so we find that our 
energy associated with mass flow is enthalpy, which is a measure of the thermal internal energy and the pressure and specific volume that it brings with it. It's the kinetic energy and it's the potential energy. And my, my question is, what's the significance of this term, right? How significant is that term? When will mass in equals mass out? Okay, so you've got like a single, single, in, single in, single out system, all right? Where the mass flow is the same, but the PV, P1, V1, or P in, V in, is very different to the P exit, V exit. So when is this term really significant? Uh, there's no change in pressure. Have a think about it. Wrestle with it. Convince yourself that there's a case where this works. Absolutely. Okay. When you're converting from a liquid to a gas, so say this was a boiler, and what you had coming in was liquid water. Yep. Liquid water. Right. So at 10 megapascal, you know, who cares? Pick, pick a pressure. Right. So the pressure in is 10 megapascal. The pressure out is 10 megapascal. The volume in, the volume flow rate in, will be quite low. Liquid water is quite dense. Okay. And then if you boil that and you've got vapor out, then your V exit term will be much larger than your VI term. Okay, so change of phase particularly will see large changes in, um, in this pressure term. So that's our flow rate in, and we've got flow rate in and flow rate out. So um, that can bring energy into the system or take energy out of the system. So our conservation of energy now looks like our heat transfers minus our work, um, put work shaft work out, and a mass flow rate. So in general, you get the equation down the bottom. So you've got heats, works, plus energy associated with mass flow in minus energy associated with mass flow out equals the change of energy in the system with respect to time, which is zero. So this is our main equation. I think I've got it. There we are, good, good. So I've got those up. So these are then our main equations, and we use these for all of our thermodynamic components. So this is the first law for open steady state systems. Steady state, steady flow, open systems. Right? Generally, we can make a bunch of simplifications, and we say, ah, velocity is not important in this case, potential energy is not important in this case, it's adiabatic, there's no Q term, you know, so you can simplify this down, and we will, but it's not bad to know where the things come from initially and know what simplifications you're making. If you know what simplifications you're making, you can know whether they're, they're reasonable to make or not. Um, so that's that. Uh, they're in purple. I put pur formulas in purple last year when I thought they were worth you memorizing them. This year, for the quizzes, I'm going to go through and grab the purple formulas and put them in a formula sheet because I said I want to provide a formula sheet for the quizzes. So. That's an example of the formula you'll get, and you'll have to make your own simplifications, okay? That'll work. Cool. So, now basically the rest of today, and probably tomorrow as well, is talking about devices that operate on this principle. So steady state, steady flow, open devices.